Uh, today we've got a special guest, Jared Pridham, uh, and we're going to be reviewing uh, the topic of moving beyond our flash clothing, you know, and what, what's entailed in that. Uh, before we get started, I just want to bring up some quick housekeeping issues as we're all working from different places. You may hear some bizarre noises in the background, like dog's hooves or small children. Uh, please disregard. In... Uh, I would also like to mention uh, our panelist, Mark McDonald, on today, uh, and I'm Eli Asuf. Uh, and Jared, if you could, next slide, please. So our story, anyone that knows us uh, will know Catalyst Sales and Marketing as a local area rep. We are reps in the Atlantic Canadian market space. We bring global manufacturers to Atlantic Canada. Next slide, please. Uh, we connect global manufacturers to local markets. Next slide. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Jared. Uh, Jared's been in the biz since 2010, a quick stint in solar, and then he moved on to Fuse Tech in 2011 through 2017. He was the Ontario Regional Sales Guy, and now he's with uh, Little Fuse as the Area Sales Manager for Eastern Canada, covering Ontario, right through to Newfoundland. Uh, Jared, I'll let you take over. Thanks again for joining us today. Eli, thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate your time. And th thanks for joining and listening to this important topic of electrical safety and how to design the right components into your system up front to improve the safety of your electrical system. Let's start with a simple illustration to make a point. Sometimes we are not aware that there's a solution to a safety risk until after the accident occurs. In the real world, it's up to us as manufacturers and to the safety managers to research, develop, and implement safety solutions before an injury occurs. It's, that's the intent of today's presentation, to share ways safety can be improved by deliberate design. This is a big topic to cover in our limited time together. We will present the highlights today, but there is also a white paper available for download in the resource list below. We'll look at what we call safety control points. These are points in a plant's electrical infrastructure that can, be, that can improve safety. Older facilities have special concern because the cost of up to update can often seem unsurmountable. We'll show you electrical safety improvements that can be made without breaking the bank. One recent study calculated that for every dollar spent on safety, companies see a return of about $3. So safety is a wise investment. Some of the areas we'll cover will be reducing incident energy, minimizing electrical shock, and finally reducing the risk by staying out of the panel altogether. Safety regulations are working. The chart on the left shows how fatal electrical injuries in the US have declined since the early 2000s. Despite that good news, you can also see by the chart on the right that non-fatal electrical injuries have declined, but not at the same rate. So what are you focused on to improve electrical safety? Is it protecting the worker with PPE? Changing workers' behaviors through training and procedures and policies, such as lockout takeout? Raising awareness through training or labeling? Reducing the severity of the hazard by using current limiting fuses? replacing the hazard altogether with arc resistant switchgear, or physically removing the hazard, the hazard with some means of remote access. When it comes to deciding how we go about making our workplace safer, the hierarchy of controls is a great reference. The focus has been on those bottom three layers, PPE, administrative controls, and awareness. To use an automotive analogy, PPE and administrative controls are seat belts and traffic laws. Awareness would be driver's training and speed limit signs. They help to avoid, but not prevent, unsafe situations and reduce the severity of injury, but don't necessarily make the car itself safe to drive. I do want to be clear on this point though. All three are critical foundations. All three are foundation blocks in the safety strategy, but there are more effective ways to make our workplace safe in conjunction with them. 
we're going to focus today on the upper section of the hierarchy for electrical systems. Engineering controls, which typically limit the fault current or incident energy. Substitution, which replaces existing equipment and controls with safer options. And elimination, which, while difficult to achieve completely, it's possible in some limited scope scenarios. In to, the 2018 edition of NFPA 70E has a lot of great improvements and the inclusion of the hierarchy of controls is included front and center among them. While it is referenced previously as an informational note, the inclusion moves the standard beyond the bottom half of the hierarchy and brings it in vocabulary that non-electrical safety professionals are already familiar with and aligns the standard more closely with CSA Z462. The other theme that is notable is the consideration that is meant to be given for potential human error. Those errors can be conscious, mis conscious mistakes, for example, somebody ignoring a PPE requirement because it just takes a second, or accidents such as someone dropping a wrench. Given that human error is a leading cause of electrical incidents, the inclusion of the higher, of hierarchy of controls directs users to evaluate options on the upper half of the hierarchy. This reduces the impact of human error on safety. Before we get into controlling risks, let's take a quick second to define what the risk is. The main three ways that people are harmed by electricity are shock, definitely the leading source of injury, arc flash, where electricity flows uh, across an air gap between conductors at different voltages, and arc blast, the pressure wave that's cre uh, created as a result of thermal expansion during an arc flash. When it comes to reducing electrical hazards for older facilities, and really for existing facilities of any age, the first and most important tool in the toolbox is an up-to-date single line diagram. You might say it's your roadmap to improvement. Without it, most of the other improvements we'll talk about are difficult to achieve. Then we can use, uh, use that to look at the coordination and replace old fuses, particularly renewables, with current limiting, indicating, and safer fuses that provide better protection. If you're in an old enough uh, industrial facility, you might even have older electrical mechanical relays, whether they're feeder, motor, overcurrent devices. Newer microprocessor-based relays don't require maintenance personnel to peri periodically remove or enter the cabinet to maintain and calibrate them. And it's getting harder to find people with that know-how. Besides, more precise measurement and additional protection features, which improve safety, the ability of new relays to communicate status and alarm to an operator remote from the panel further improves the safety. Finally, hopefully most of you have done an arc flash study by now, but if not, it's definitely recommended to help identify high risk areas. The results of the study can be used as a starting uh, as a start managing that risk, including the hierarchy of controls that we just spoke of. When we talk about updated single line diagrams being important, one of the pieces that will help you understand is the grounding system. Most electrical faults, 95% of them, are ground faults. The majority of electrical injuries are shock related, and most shocks are ground faults. So it's a good place to start. This is not to say that phase to phase or three phase faults almost never happen, but they often escalate from ground faults. Only about 5% of electrical faults are not initiated by ground faults. And in these cases, the root cause is usually miswiring, accidental shorting, or human error. One type of ground fault is when a person standing on the ground or touching something that is electrically bonded to ground comes in contact with an energized phase conductor. In a residential, low power world, we've had, we've had what are called class A, ground fault circuit interrupters, or GFCIs, since the 70s, and they have done a great job in reducing the number of people killed at home by electricity. When we talk about factories and industrial facilities, the voltages and leakage current means that Class A GFCIs isn't a viable option in most cases. In the graph on the right, you will see the effect that GFCIs in the home have had on reducing the number of electrocutions. What we we want to do the same thing at work. On the left, you can see what levels of current we're dealing with. The bottom line, six milliamps is class A GFCI. 
below the, the let go threshold. It takes about 50 milliamps for an adult heart to go into fibrillation. What UL has done is given a bit more flexibility to industry is to create two new GFCI classes under UL 943C. Class C and Class D GFCI strip at 20 milliamps, providing personnel protection while giving more flexibility for industrial applications. These new classes, which can be used up to 600 volt, are referenced to as special purpose GFCIs. I should mention that although they trip at 20 milliamps, they follow the same trip curve defined by UL 943C, which means that the trip time of a class C or class D at 20 milliamps is faster than a class A at six milliamps. The other type of device is an equipment ground fault protection device, which has the acronym of EGFPD. That name makes it clear that it is not personnel protection because it allows adjustment of the trip level up to 100 milliamps, although again, it operates at the same UL 943 time current curve as GFCIs. Here are some examples of specialty purpose GFCIs and EGFPD devices that are available on the market today. Going back to the hierarchy, a special purpose GFCI provides a safer substitute for the assured bonding program and for all applications provided and an engineering control that reduces the risk of shock. By the way, if you are considering industrial shock protection, make sure you check the standards that the products are tested to. The term GFCI isn't protected, so even if a product calls itself a GFCI and the marketing shows the UL 943 trip curve, it may not pass UL 943C. You can get more information on both devices at the link provided below. There are plenty of hazards in an arc flash. It's like a bolt of lightning, intense light, sound, and energy. The amount of heat is discharged, a high amount of heat is discharged, vaporizing bus bars and creating a huge amount of expansion in the conductors and air. That expansion creates a pressure wave that often blows apart pieces of equipment, travels at 700 miles per hour, and may contain pieces of molten metal and shrapnel. Of course, there is a risk of fire and toxic smoke from insulation and other material burning. Aside from the safety risk to personnel, there is a risk of equip risk to equipment, uptime, operation, and liability, as you can see here. The cost can skyrocket if you have to leave an entire plant offline for a critical piece of equipment so it can be rebuilt or replaced. What determines the severity of an arc flash? When we talk about arc flash thermal energy, we're talking about current squared in time, or I squared T. But the actual system energy to run motors, for example, is a function of the system voltage and current. Psychologically, there's a perception that low system voltage means safer. An electrician might work on 600 volts without too much hesitation, but refuse to go near 15 kV. kV. But the normal current of a 600 volt system is usually higher. Of course, the available fault current is what determines the energy available of, to the arc, and if there is sufficient energy to maintain the arc. This is a function of the size of the transformer or generator supplying the power of the arc. The current is limited by the impedance of the system, and then the characteristics of the arc itself is determined by the fault impedance. The, greater gap, the bigger gap means more impedance, which means less current if, there, if we hold all variables the same. And the distance that an object or person is from the arc determines how much heat is transferred. These factors can be tweaked to a certain extent at the design phase, but aren't likely to change after the fact. That leaves time, which is the focus of engineering controls for arc flash risk mitigation. At the design phase, a straightforward way to reducing available energy is using a flatter electrical topology. In this example, we replace a 20 MVA transformer with two 10 MVA transformers feeding separate buses, halving the arc flash energy. Of course, if you connect those buses together, the arc will just be fed from both directions. So the buses do need to be isolated for this to result in an energy reduction. Another form of arc flash mitigation is in another form that's in vogue is arc resistant switchgear. 
it acts as a permanent layer of very effective PPE, redirecting the arc, flash, and blast energy up and out and away from the workers. This type of gear is expensive on its own, and it can be even more so once you factor in retrofitting a building to vent the arc. Since the arc is contained inside the equipment, the equipment damage can be catastrophic, but of course, that is secondary to human life. If a door is open during an arc flash, then the additional protection of arc resistant gear is neutralized. So we're back to time. And that's not a consolation prize. So here you can see an arc flash without any time limitation. And you see all the molten metal that looks like orange snow that is liquefied and vaporized copper. So if we were to make a uh, if that were to make contact with your skin, or if you were to breathe it in, it would cause burns and not be very pleasant. The screwdriver itself is halfway vaporized and halfway thrown clear, so you can see that there's quite a bit of energy released. Now you'll see in the next video how time really does make a difference. Reducing arcing time doesn't get rid of the arc flash completely, but it does visibly reduce the energy significantly. That's a pretty big energy reduction. So as you just saw, current limiting overprotection devices limit the destructive energy to a small fraction that could flow in the circuit if the current limiting devices were not used. It's important to point out that there are two differences between current limiting devices and the time factor associated with each. But before I show you a few things on this slide, let me first provide you a quick explanation of what is meant by current limiting. UL listed circuit breakers that are labeled current limiting must pass a series of short circuit tests and clear the test circuit in less than a half of a cycle. However, UL does not impose different I squared T limitations for different circuit breaker ratings. You must check with the circuit breaker manufacturer to determine the maximum I squared T of the circuit breaker used. Fuses must also clear the circuit in less than a half cycle, something that is very easy to accomplish with fuses. UL fuse classes, including RK5, RK1, J, T, and CC are all considered current limiting fuses. However, there are different differences between each in the degree or levels of current limitation. And I'll show you examples of that in just a minute. And of course, being a fuse company, we recommend the use of current limiting fuses as an important method for reducing arc flash energy release. So now looking at the slide, the gray area under the curve represents all the energy release in the event of a, of a fault when using old renewable fuses or more commonly found non-current limiting circuit breakers. But when a current limiting fuse is used, in this case an RK5 design, the fuse clears the circuit before the first half cycle, thereby drastically reducing the total energy dissipated. So this, this blue curve shows an RK5 fuse whereas the green curve shows an RK1 fuse of the same physical dimension. UL class J and class T fuses are even more current limiting, followed by class CC. These minimize the potential damaging energies even more. The difference in energy from just switching the fuse can be seen in this next slide. So thinking back to the hierarchy of controls pyramid, we're again talking about the effectiveness of substitution. Let's run through a quick example of how substituting one fuse type for another, in this case, upgrading RK5 to an RK1 fuse, can be very effective at mitigating potential arc flash hazards. We're looking here at, uh, at, a one, at one simple or a one line diagram as part of an arc flash hazard analysis. In this part of the system, we're using RK5 200 amp fuses with an incident energy was calculated at 11.6 calorie per centimeter squared. That equates to a PPE category of three, which means that electrical workers should have to get full PPE gear to work on the system if energized. By comparison, on the right side, we have the same part of the system, but have simply upgraded to a, a class RK1 200 amp fuse. The result is that the incident energy is now calculated at 3.5 calorie per centimeter squared, resulting in a PPE category of one. 
a considerably less PPE gear for the worker. In fact, probably in line with his daily wear out on the plant floor. So a simple substitution can result in a considerable reduction in risk. As already discussed, the energy release of an arc flash is a function of time. The longer it persists, the more energy is released. As a real life example of this, think of holding your finger over a flame versus moving it quickly across. We want to now shift gears from current limiting fuses to another product that can be designed in or retrofitted into existing equipment. I'm referring to a product known as arc flash relays. The principal idea of an arc flash relay is just to limit the time an arc persists in the event of a fault and thus minimizing the energy released in the system. With a detection and response time of less than one millisecond, the real limiting factor is the circuit breaker being used and how well it's maintained. Even with that factored in, a typical circuit breaker time is 35 to 60 milliseconds, which still puts us well below the typical time needed for a cable to catch fire in the event of a 50 kA arc. Note that within 20 mil or 200 milliseconds, steel would catch fire. To put that in pers into perspective, the blink of an eye takes about 300 milliseconds. This slide shows the Little Fuse family of arc flash relays, all designed to use light instead of current to detect an arc without worrying of various sources of temporary overcurrents. Each of these products detect and trip connected breakers quickly. These relays can be designed into new equipment or retrofitted into existing equipment by reducing the potential energy level in the system. This makes facilities safer while reducing potential damages to any arc flash that may occur. More information on this family of arc flash relay products is available online at the website um, that you can see here on this slide. So in our hierarchy of controls pyramid, we've talked about the varying levels of effectiveness achievable by the different design and methods. The most effective of these is to eliminate the opportunity of hazard. And it's possible to approach those types of levels of electrical safety by reducing exposure of electricity altogether. Technology is now, has now advanced such that remote communications via methods such as Bluetooth means that now the worker doesn't have to approach the panel. For that matter, they can just walk by or even stay in their vehicle to provide and monitor diagnostics without even have to open the panel. Many of you have heard of the internet or IIoT or Internet of Things, where wireless communication is connecting multiple devices. Everything from Nest thermostats in your home to touchscreen displays in your refrigerators to smart water and gas meters being installed by your utility companies means there's an ever growing demand and interest in data. This type of technology now exists in overload protection relays. In our case, the MP8000 Bluetooth Enhanced Motor Protection Overload Relay does just that. Wireless Bluetooth communication enables us to replace all the buttons and knobs on the faceplate of the relay with the ability to view faults and adjust settings from the comforts of the smartphone or tablet. An easy to use interface on the available Apple and Android supported app provides better functionality. And as mentioned, it enhances safety since now workers do not need enter the control panel to take readings and make adjustments. This mitigates the need for PPE while also increasing productivity. And one relay does it all with a wide range of voltages and currents in one model. And more information on this product can be found on this link below. So in this presentation, I used the hierarchy of controls to walk through some of the safety control points where Components can be used to control, substitute, and even eliminate electrical risk in a facility. Upgrading components and systems such as resistance grounding, monitoring, current limiting fuses, arc flash relays, and industrial GFCIs, as well as Bluetooth technology, uh, can uh, designed into safety need not be expensive, and the return on safety investment is well worth it. Workers and business owners need to be reminded that while PPE is essential, it is the last line of defense against electrical hazards. Even one incident can cost more than the price of a component upgrade, so there is no excuse to not considering it. Working together, we can make electrical shock and arc flash injuries in industrial environments much less common. On behalf of Little Fuse, I'd like to thank you all for your time today. Thanks a lot, uh, Jared. We really appreciate you being on here with us uh, and, and giving us this presentation. Uh, we got some 
frequently asked the questions here, Jared, and I'm just going to read some out. Maybe you want to add uh, what you think. And uh, the first one here, what is a fuse audit and how would it benefit my facility? Perfect. Thanks, Eli. So if, if what a fuse audit is, um, as we all probably know, when you go into an industrial facility, into a storage crib or materials uh, storage area, what we find typically, there's a lot of um, duplicates and fuses, whether it be from three, four different manufacturers. And what an arc flash or what a fuse audit does is it allows us to provide the end user with a report indicating what they have in stock and allowing us to reduce that inventory. When we do the arc for the fuse audit, we identify any type of fuses that could be potential arc flash hazards, whether they be a fuse with a low interrupting rating or a renewable fuse that you know, could be upgraded with a uh, more safer product. And we indicate what that safer product is. So it's a free service that we provide at Little Fuse. And again, what it does is, is it allows us to identify hazardous fuses that could be potential arc flash hazards and provide a recommended upgrade to a safer product. All right, excellent. That's a free service that, that you guys provide. Yeah, correct. All right, uh, uh, next question that we get asked often is, you know, what is an arc flash study? And and importantly, who does them? Great, that's a great question. So an arc flash study is a, is a look at the electrical system in a facility. Arc flash studies are typically done by professional electrical engineers. So in your area, you may have engineering firms like a Hat, Chesson C. Lovelin, Wood Group, and McFoster Wheeler. Um, these types of companies and similar electrical engineering companies will perform arc flash studies. These arc flash studies, they will look at the single line diagram of the complete electrical system in a facility and indicate where they feel that there could be potential upgrades to components. The upgrades to components could be you know, replacing a older fuse with a newer fuse, replacing an older breaker with a breaker that has a higher interrupting rating, right? Or um, even providing um, installation of arc flash relays to reduce the incident energy available in a in a unsafe working environment. So um, again, electrical engineering firms do these. It's a service that they provide, um, but some of the products that Little Fuse has can be integrated into our flash studies. Okay, yeah, and anybody on that, uh, that wants a list of local uh, companies that do our flash studies, just reach out to us. Uh, and the next question, where can I find Find the information to best create a safety program. For for years, Jared, I've uh, instructed folks to use the CSA Z four six two when it comes to clothing. But uh, what would you recommend for a total, you know, a total safety program? So that's good. Z four sixty two is a good start of, of where to look at for uh, safety recommendations and how to implement a safety program. Also it's very important to talk to your health and safety representatives at your facility. Uh, they may, you know, be, be working with that same program with, with the Z462 and looking at uh, recommendations for PPE requirements. However, working with them to let them know about other products that are available in the market, because um, they're only as, um, as updated as, you know, the information that's provided to them. So what I've done a lot is worked with health and safety program managers at end user facilities to let them know about, you know, newer products that we have, products that make plants safer. Um, and they've received that very well. Also talking to your local inspectors to see what kind of information they can provide, um, whether it be, it's like a package that they can provide to a health and safety person at a end user facility. Um, but again, uh, talking to those health and safety departments will really allow you to put that safety program in place. Nowadays, safety is king and, you know, and health and safety departments have a different kind of budget than a maintenance person does. So, um, you know, I definitely reach out to people in that kind of position. All right. Well, uh, we're just coming on to 1030 here now, I see. And Jared, I'll just get you to push through to the next slide. All right, uh, I wanted to give a shout out to our manufacturers, uh, Little Fuse, Fuse Tech, and PMMI. Next slide, please. You can get in touch with us 
podcasts on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or visit our website at www.catalystsales.ca.